The views and goals of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party were so polarizing that there's not too much room for fence city. Either you agreed or you disagreed, and fortunately there were plenty of ordinary people who put their feet down and said, we're not going to stand for this. Fritz Gerlich was a member of what's arguably one of the most dangerous, most influential professions in the world, journalism. Born in Germany in 1883, he was editor-in-chief of a newspaper when he had a sit-down chat with Hitler, and he didn't like what he heard, even in 1923. When his newspaper later fell in line with Nazi propaganda, Gerlich left to start his own paper, Der Gera de V. In it, he made it clear that extremism wasn't the Germany he loved, and when Hitler's niece was killed in 1931 by the dictator's personal pistol, Gerlich made it clear just what he thought that Hitler had ordered her death. Gerlich went hard into the investigation into her murder and absolutely published what he found, that Hitler was involved. Gerlich continued to mock and ridicule Hitler in the very public forum, even using the Nazis' beloved racial sciences to prove Hitler wasn't even Aryan. He was, by his own definition, Mongol and Slavic. Gerlich wrote, Hitler's attitude is absolutely un-Nordic and un-Germanic. It is absolute despotism and can be explained by the fact that this man is a typical bastard. It's unsurprising that on March 9, 1934, Nazi stormtroopers raided Gerlich's offices, destroyed everything, and shipped him off to Dachau. He was killed more than a year later on June 30, 1934, a night that became known as the Night of the Long Knives. His wife was mailed his bloody glasses. Virginia Hall had such a natural talent for espionage that it was only after a chance meeting and minimal training that she became one of the first spies the British sent in France, and her story is the stuff of legend. The nation was already occupied by the Nazis in 1941, and she started gathering her info by getting friendly with the owner of a brothel. Why? They were more than happy to pass along information her girls heard from the chatty Gestapo agents who came calling. Hall ultimately went on to become crucial to the organization of the French resistance while still remaining a shadowy, elusive figure. Klaus Barbie, the head of the Gestapo in France, plastered Paris with wanted posters and did almost manage to catch her after she sprang allies from a prison camp. She escaped and embarked on a grueling hike across the Pyrenees Mountains. A shocking 50 miles later, she was arrested in Spain. Her escape is made even more impressive considering she did it while hampered by a heavy wooden leg, one she'd named Cuthbert. Once she finally made it back to Britain, they refused to send her back, so she joined up with the Americans, filed down her teeth so she could pass for a French peasant, and kicked off a campaign of sabotage and reclaiming villages from Nazi occupiers. That's wildly impressive, especially for an agent who was expected to survive in Nazi territory for only a matter of days. She was never captured and died in 1982, having never spoken about her wartime exploits. Children are the future, it said, and Hitler certainly thought so. Every German and non-Jewish boy was technically required to join the Hitler Youth, but some kids had other ideas. Among them were the Swing Judent, or Swing Kids. They weren't exactly an organized group of active resistors, but they showed their complete dislike of Nazi ideals by being the exact opposite of the clean-cut, disciplined, uniformed, and proper members of the Hitler Youth. These were the kids who met in secret, accepted anyone regardless of their religion, and embraced jazz, swing dancing, and the teenage culture of Britain and the US. Their festivals were described as, quote, an appalling sight, where teens, quote, all jitterbugged on the stage like wild animals. The swing unit earned the ire of Heinrich Himmler in particular. Himmler targeted the so-called ringleaders of the swing unit for deportation to concentration camps, where they would be sentenced for up to three years for their disobedience. It's such a waste. So much passion. For nothing. The rebellious actions of the Swing Judent escalated as the war went on, and by 1942, there were members of the group in camps like Auschwitz, Ravensbrück, and Bergen-Belsen. The rebellion continued inside, where some groups reassembled to sing for other prisoners. When talking about World War II, it's important to remember that being German and being Nazi weren't necessarily the same things. Some Germans did everything in their power to bring down or at least damage the regime from the shadows. Hans Scholl and his sister Sophie were among the founders of the resistance group The White Rose. In 2013, White Rose member Lisa Lett First Romdor explained the group's motivation to the BBC. The war was dreadful, with the battles and so many people dying, and Hitler was a megalomaniac, and so they had to do something. First Romdor had already lost her husband to the fighting by the time she joined, and the group was already in full swing. They had begun writing and printing leaflets, telling the truth about the Nazi regime and encouraging resistance, while taking to the streets at night to cover the buildings of Munich in anti-Nazi graffiti. The Scholl siblings were distributing their leaflets at the University of Munich when they were arrested. They were put on trial and ultimately executed as traitors. 
The Gestapo continued to hunt the remaining members of the White Rose, and First Ramdor was also arrested. After spending about a month in custody, she was released and trailed by the Gestapo, who were still looking for other members. In 1943, Allied aircraft brought millions of copies of the last White Rose leaflet across Germany. His name was Ivan Sidorenko, and like many, he didn't find his true calling until it came and found him. Sidorenko was an artist who signed up with the Soviet Army at the beginning of the war, and he was originally assigned to an infantry and artillery unit during 1941's Battle of Moscow. He would regularly wander off on his own during his downtime, and that's when he found out he was really good at sneaking around and killing Germans before they even knew he was there. The higher-ups saw some serious potential and started sending Sidorenko out to do what he had been doing on his own, usually with a student or two in tow. Not only did he teach his methods, which were based on his philosophy of one shot, one kill to hundreds of other students, but by the end of the war, he would be credited with around 500 kills. And that's not just individual soldiers. Sidorenko would destroy entire supply vehicles, tanks, and tanker trucks with explosive bullets. He was wounded in 1944 and was forced to sit out the rest of the war, but he and his snipers had done their job, in spite of the counter snipers the Germans deployed solely to target them. Publicly denouncing the Nazi regime and their actions was a great way to find yourself on a crowded train headed to a terrible and often final destination. Still, speaking out against Hitler's policies was exactly what Clemens August Count von Galen spent much of the war doing. And that was a huge problem for the Third Reich because he was Germany's Bishop of Munster. In 1939, Hitler gave the go-ahead to start killing patients considered incurable. That became known as Operation T4 and targeted those with mental and physical disabilities. Parents of children with disabilities were encouraged to drop their kids off at specific locations, and by 1940, dedicated gas chambers had been set up around the country. The program led to the deaths of at least 70,273 people and was vocally condemned by Bishop von Galen. He put such pressure on the Nazis that Hitler officially ended the program on August 29, 1941, although the practice itself continued and von Galen continued to speak out against everything from the Nazi theories of racial superiority to their euthanasia programs. Von Galen's status within the church protected him from direct retribution, but that protection didn't extend to a number of the priests who repeated his anti-Nazi sermons. Norway had a complicated position during the war. They were originally neutral, but the Nazi war machine invaded in April 1940 and set up an occupation, much as they did with France. What followed was a lot of German insistence that their way was now the only way, and a lot of Norwegians pointing out that no, that wasn't how it was going to work at all. That resistance was led by the nation's teachers. The Nazis weren't just out to win the war, they were trying to lay the groundwork for the new world they wanted to see spring from a Nazi victory. To that end, they pushed teachers to feature only Nazi-friendly curriculums in their classrooms. When they tried that with Norway, around 8,000 teachers refused. Hitler installed a prime minister sympathetic to the cause, and when the education system as a whole outright pushed back, that's when P.N. Wittgen Kischling decided to make an example and sent 499 teachers to forced labor camps that had been set up north of the Arctic Circle. Parents were almost overwhelmingly supportive of the teachers as they lived in the far reaches of the freezing north with only cardboard shelters and supplies smuggled in from sympathetic families. And they won. When their plight went public, they were sent home, and they never taught the Nazis' educational program in their schools. Kischling, meanwhile, was described as broken by the resistance. After the war, he was executed for treason, and his name has become a synonym for traitor. When Lyubmila Pavlichenka enlisted in 1941, recruiters first tried to push her into the field of nursing. Once they realized how good she was with a gun, though, they put her into the 25th Rifle Division of the Red Army, and they made her a sniper. It wasn't long before the Germans were saying her name, Lady Death, in fear. Her patience and self-control were legendary, once remaining in the same place for three days before getting a clear shot of her target. That target was just one of many, and even as she accumulated 309 confirmed kills, she faced off with German officers who, when they discovered they couldn't kill her, decided to bribe her with an officer's position in their army. She never wavered. After being wounded for a fourth time, Pavlichenko was sent to the U.S. to raise support for the war, which she did in an epic way. After deflecting comments about her uniform and her femininity, she asked the crowd, Gentlemen, I am 25 years old and I have killed 309 fascist occupants by now. Don't you think, gentlemen, that you have been hiding behind my back for too long? Pavlichenko never returned to the field. Instead, she trained the snipers who went to war after her, and her story doesn't have a happy ending. Suffering from depression and PTSD, she died in 1974 at age 58. 
Today, we know what was going on in the network of concentration camps set up by the Nazis. But when they invaded Poland in 1939, no one had the foggiest idea what was going on. And in order to find out, one member of the Polish resistance said goodbye to his young wife and children and volunteered to head off into the very depths of hell on earth. That man was Witold Pilecki. He got himself arrested and sent to Auschwitz, and it very nearly ended in a fast and brutal way. Narrowly avoiding being one of the 10 men pulled aside and shot as an example to others, he was told, the rations have been calculated so that you will only survive six weeks. Poleczki organized an underground resistance within the camp, and at the same time he was smuggling information out, he was conducting operations to steal food, sabotage the Nazis, and spread what little information he received back into the camp. He and his crew even took out a good number of SS guards by some creative methods, like collecting typhus carrying lice and infecting the clothing of the officers. In 1943, Pilecki, now sick and frail, escaped. His messages had made it all the way to Allied Command in London and were an invaluable source of intel, and his story isn't a happy one. Suffering from depression and PTSD, he later fought in support of a free Poland and in 1947 was arrested and executed as an enemy of communism. One French resistance member described the woman nicknamed the White Mouse like this, She is the most feminine woman I know until the fighting starts, and she is like five men. Credited with needing nothing more than her bare hands to kill an SS guard, Nancy Wake was the one who went on record as saying, In my humble opinion, the only good German was a dead one, and the deader the better. I rejoiced in the fact that I killed them. She went on to add, I'm sorry I couldn't kill more. This was the Australian woman who picked up and moved to London when she was just 16, and who later had the misfortune to be living in France when it fell to Nazi occupation. She started out carrying messages for the resistance, but after fleeing to Britain, the Gestapo right on her heels, she returned to train guerrilla fighters and head up an arm of the resistance that ultimately had more than 7,000 members. Wake's exploits are nothing short of legendary, and the one she dubbed the most useful was bicycling just over 300 miles in less than 72 hours to deliver secret codes. She was also behind the network that smuggled hundreds of allies out of Nazi territory, arranged weapons drops, trained thousands for D-Day, and made the hard decisions, including interrogating suspected Nazi spies and, in at least one case, sentencing them to execution. In spite of the bounty the Gestapo placed on her head, Wake survived the war. She died in 2011 at 98 years old. I don't know what, but if ever I can do something one day, I'll do it. And that is why. Usually, history tends to remember those who protested against the Nazi regime as the good guys, but here's the weird thing. The group that branded themselves the Edelweiss Pirates is still remembered as a loose criminal organization. And that's strange. Historians are fighting to turn their legacy from petty thieves into resistance fighters, and it's pretty dark stuff. Jean Ulysse is one of the survivors, and he recounted how his father had been beaten and dragged from his home alongside his mother and aunt, and how he had been sent to an orphanage. Later told he needed to join the Hitler Youth, the memory was still fresh for Ulysse. So instead, he joined a less formal group called the Edelweiss Pirates, and at their peak, there were about 3,000 in their home city of Cologne. While they started out singing songs and pulling pranks, it escalated along with the war. Soon they were smashing the windows of factories, destroying Nazi transportation, and even derailing trains. Clearly, the Nazis were not cool with this. They were condemned as riffraff that threatened the Nazi foundations of the German youth, and on November 10, 1944, they made a show of hanging 13 Edelweiss pirates, including Eulish's friend, 16-year-old Bartholomew Schink. Even though Ian Fleming never confirmed exactly who was the inspiration for the James Bond franchise's money penny, it's pretty clear the answer is Vera Atkins. Atkins, who died in 2000 at the age of 92, was at the head of the Special Operations Executive Spy Agency's F Division. Those were the units that were sent into France, and Hitler was so fed up with them that he famously promised they were going to be among the first he hanged when he got to London. He, of course, never got there, and Atkins had a lot to do with that. She was in charge of training the spies in what might be the most valuable part of being a successful agent, blending in. Not only was she responsible for wartime training, but she also proved a force to be reckoned with post-war. That's when she took the names of the 117 division members who had died at the hands of the Nazis and promised to get them each justice. And she did. She spent more than a year traveling Europe and interrogating everyone from concentration camp guards to Rudolf Hess. And those already on the front called her one of the most effective interrogators working for the Allies. Not only was she able to determine exactly what had happened to the missing agents, but when she suggested to Hess that he had overseen 1.5 million deaths, he confessed the actual number. 2,345,000.
First, a bit of background on the Lebensborn program. The program was, in a nutshell, started by Heinrich Himmler as a sort of selective breeding project designed to create a master race. In some cases, children who fit the racial profile were plucked from the arms of the women who gave birth to them in concentration camps, adopted into Nazi families, and never knew where they really came from. That's where a Polish midwife named Stanisława Leszczynska comes in. She was sent to Auschwitz in 1943, after spending four years helping smuggle Jews out of Łódź ghetto. She was tasked with caring for pregnant women, and in this case, she quickly found that caring for meant killing the majority of the newborn babies. Leszczynska not only refused, but she stood up to Joseph Mengele to do so. No one is really sure why she wasn't executed, but instead she was sent back into the camp and worked to at least save the mothers that she could. Along the way, she secretly tattooed the babies who were born and then taken away to be shuttled into the Lebensborn program. It's estimated that she delivered around 3,000 babies, and about 500 were taken away and adopted into other families. Thanks to her, many had the chance to learn where it really came from. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about the darkest periods in history are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.